In this short webinar, we'll walk through some of the common mistakes that people make when using high-performance computing systems. First, please do not run anything CPU-intensive on the cluster's login nodes. Login nodes are meant only as the lightweight interface to the system. You can use these nodes to compile your codes, prepare simulation runs, submit your jobs, track their progress, look at your job's output, and organize files. Login nodes are used by many people at the same time, so running anything intensive there will have a negative impact on many users. All heavy calculations should be submitted as production jobs to the scheduler, which will be looking for the requested resources and start your job once these resources are available. When submitting jobs, please request only the resources that you require, number of CPUs and GPUs, memory, and running time. The most common mistake is to either underestimate or overestimate your job's memory and running time requirements. If you underestimate them, then your job will be killed once it exceeds its memory limit or reaches its maximum time limit. If you overestimate them, then your job is likely to wait longer in the queue because you are asking for more resources. And when it runs, some of the resources will be wasted. The solution is to study carefully your code's requirements and then submit a job specifying the actual needs with a little bit of a cushion, perhaps 50 or 20% on top of your estimates. Figuring out the maximum running time is fairly easy. Figuring out memory requirements is somewhat more complex. The best solution is to be intimately familiar with all the data structures allocated by your code and their memory usage. Unfortunately, not all of us are familiar with the internal workings of the codes that we run. However, you can use Slurm's display accounting data command as a CCT to print the memory and time usage of a completed job using the syntax shown in this slide. The output will give you five columns listing the job ID, the job's name, the memory that you ask from Slurm in megabytes, whether per node or per core, the maximum amount of memory used on any one node or any one core, depending on the previous field, and the time it took to run your job. Note that Slurm's accounting mechanism is based on sampling at equally space points in time and might not always catch spikes in memory usage. Sometimes you can run into a situation where your running process is killed by the Linux kernel since it has exceeded its memory limit, but Slurm did not poll the process at the right time to see the spike in usage that caused the kernel to kill the process and reports low memory usage. Similarly, if your job ran too fast, as a CCT output in the memory field might be empty, since Slurm has not had time to pull the job. There is no perfect solution, but the more you run your code, the better you will be at estimating its memory requirements. Please pay attention to the efficiency of your code. If it is in a compiled language, such as C or C++ or Fortran, make sure you use optimization flags dash 2 and dash 3 these will take slightly longer to compile, but a code on average will run much faster. Please be aware that not all programming languages are equal in terms of performance. Python has been getting popular in recent years as a fantastic scripting language. Note that its native arithmetic and loops are a factor of 80 to 200 times slower compared to compiled language. So if you are doing a lot of coding in Python, and most CPU time is spent inside a native Python code as opposed to precompiled libraries such as NumPy or SciPy, you might get much better performance rewriting the most demanding parts in the compiled language as opposed to paralyzing your original Python code. Currently, there are many attempts at building an efficient Python compiler, but let's just say things are not yet where we would like them to be. So please study the performance of your code and all available options before you decide to run at large scale on a high performance computing system. The same applies to R and Java languages. 
their performance is well below a comparable C, C++ or Fortran code. Our distributed parallel file systems have been optimized for storing a small number of large files. That means that you should not create millions of small files, as the file system performance would drop dramatically. On your laptop, you might have a directory with 100,000 files, and it will work more or less fine. On a cluster, if you try to CD into a directory with 100,000 files and do a less to list all files, it might take a very long time to get any response. So what can you do if your code outputs many files? Well, the ideal solution is to modify your code to write to a smaller number of files. If this is not possible, then archive your files with the standard Linux tar command, storing many files in a single archive. There is also an impressive Linux utility called DAR, D -A -R, that is similar to tar but supports indexing and differential archives, so that looking up stuff inside a DAR archive and extracting files is much faster than with tar. Whatever solution you use, please learn to use one of these tools to manage your files. If you work with large datasets, more than a few megabytes, please ensure you store them in binary as opposed to text or ASCII. Storing a single precision number in binary will take four bytes, whereas storing it as text will take four times as much space for all the decimal digits, signs, exponents, and separators. With many gigabytes of output, a factor of four would make a huge difference in terms of the overall disk space usage and the input-output speeds. Even better than raw binary, if you're storing large arrays or other complex structures, please consider storing them using portable scientific data formats such as NetCDF, HDF5, and others. Using these formats will not only give you data portability so that you can write data on one system and read on another, or write with one tool and read with another. These files will also include headers with data description, and optionally such formats support compression and parallel input-output. There are libraries for reading and writing NetCDF, HDF5, and other formats for pretty much any programming language. So there's no reason not to use them if you work with large data sets. Please make sure you use the right file system as not all of them are equal in terms of read-write speed, purge policies, availability, and quotas. For details on these, please watch our file system webinar in this series. If you no longer need files, please consider archiving them either on our long-term storage or on your own hard drives, and then deleting them from our faster file systems. Finally, if you run parallel simulations and write data from multiple processes, consider using parallel input-output libraries, as opposed to collecting everything on a single processor and writing from there, or writing into multiple files. The message passing interface in PI library has functions for parallel read-write, and NetCDF and HDF5 that I mentioned before also support parallel input-output.